happy to be here and present this uh, research, which is uh, the result of a, a practitioner researcher uh, pr a partnership between Mercy Corps Nigeria uh, and myself, Rebecca Lipman, Chad Hazlett, and uh, Elizabeth Nugent. Um, and what we try to address is um, what I see as one of the biggest policy problems in, in Northeast Nigeria in the last five to seven years, which is that there have been a set of people who are trying to return from an association or involvement in the violent extremist group Boko Haram back into their communities. And the problem that they have faced is that um, communities are not willing to have them uh, come back. So this is a, a, a varied set of, of people uh, some of them are former fighters, and some of them have held more support roles as uh, cooks, drivers, um, and and some of them who have been some some women who have been forced into um, marriages with um, with with Boko Haram fighters. So these people uh, are are coming back, and communities are are worried about the security implications of these people who, from their perspective, went into the forest. They don't know what happened then, and now are coming back uh, into town. Uh, so they don't know whether they uh, were uh, quote unquote radicalized, um, and they don't know what, uh, what their intentions are in, in coming back into the community. And so in the first uh, instances of people uh, coming out, one, they've been segregated. So in the, my first visit to my degree in, in 2015, um, the, in the IDP camps, you'll see a set of people that are set off from the rest of the uh, camp who are, uh, who are these former associates um, who aren't allowed to even sit with their, uh, their families and kind of fellow, fellow villagers. Um, and more recently, there have been a set of, of more systematic efforts to bring, uh, bring these returnees back into their communities from the government, which has a set of pathways for returnees to come from government-held uh, detention facilities back into their communities. And in several of the earliest cases, um, these truckfuls of returnees were rejected from their communities. And they, they, they refused to allow them to come back in. They felt that they hadn't been provided information on, on who they are and what kind of rehabilitation process they, they had gone through, if any. And so uh, th this is a big problem from the, from the perspective of addressing uh, the possible return to conflict because this is a set of people who have potentially been uh, part of this violent extremist group and uh, if not provided an opportunity to go back to their community may stay in these government detention facilities uh, or, or even return to the conflict. So what can we do about this? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, first, I want to give you a sense of the, um, what, what this kind of means in, in the uh, community, um, uh, commu in terms of community acceptance. So we conducted a survey in 2017 uh, in internally displaced persons camps uh, in, in Northeast Nigeria to try to understand both what the barriers to acceptance were and also um, how, how people were thinking about it. So we found quite extreme attitudes towards um, how returnees should be treated. 90% of people felt that they should be uh, tortured either for uh, kind of retribution or to obtain information about, uh, about the, uh, the armed group. And about 50% uh, even supported capital punishment for some of the returnees who had had the most extreme roles. In terms of uh, community uh, support for uh, actually accepting people back into their own community, only about 50% of people said that they were willing to accept a former member of Boko Haram back into their community. And when you kind of probe them to, to try to understand why that is, again, it's a, it's a mix of both uh, fear about what they would do in their community and anger toward their um, kind of past actions. Drilling down into to what that looks like in terms of the social, economic, and political reintegration, um, we asked people what kinds of activities they would be willing to allow people to do when they came back. Um, and so we asked a, a range of different behavioral intentions about whether you would allow them to come back, whether you would allow them to participate in community meetings, whether you would allow them to run for office and whether you would vote for them, um, et cetera. And so the, these, these all ranged around, around 50%. So what can we do about this? We, we test uh, one particular idea, uh, which is that uh, trusted authorities may be able to change minds and shift norms about important pro-social behaviors. Uh, this idea came from a set of focus groups that we conducted in, in 2016 um, with, the, with populations that, that could be uh, potentially accepting returnees. And this idea that uh, people sought advice and took cues from leaders came up again and again in our interviews. So people said that we would seek guidance from our leaders, and if they said to welcome them back, um, we would. 
So given the background of uh, this conflict setting and the fact that people have these extremely negative views towards people coming back, I think it's quite striking that people would be willing to, on the basis of uh, a cue from their leader, um, shift. And so we wanted to test out whether, whether this was kind of a, a, a systematic tool that, that, that could be used by the government and, and civil society agencies. Um, we're not the only ones who noticed this. This is, this is a w kind of widespread um, idea, both in Nigeria and in other conflict contexts, where trainings and built networks of local leaders, and particularly religious leaders, um, have been used to try to elevate the voices of these leaders and, um, and help uh, build pro uh, lead to pro-social uh, behavior change. So why, why, why might this work? Um, trusted authorities, uh, we know from a range of literature from American politics, um, uh, are, are listened to uh, by people who are looking for cues about what they should believe uh, and what kinds of decisions uh, they should make. Um, they're also sig uh, signals of social norms. Um, so people often uh, make decisions based on what they think other people are going to do and what they think other people think that they should do. And leaders provide a signal of uh, the, of those of those social norms. We're going to focus on religious leaders in particular, um, in part because uh, these are often highly trusted leaders. These are people people that are in this context uh, trusted by 97% of of people, more trusted than any other institution in, in Northeast Nigeria. Um, and they also have, I think, two, two particular characteristics among leaders that are, that are relevant. The first is that uh, they have the ability to legitimately use religious texts as a means for um, for leading to attitudinal and behavior change, and they're also sought out for, for advice on, on a variety of different topics, and so people are actively going and, and trying to find out what, they, what their local imams think about um, issues related to, to resolving the conflict. So what did we actually do? We worked with a senior uh, Islamic cleric in Maiduguri, and we recorded a set of audio messages uh, in collaboration with him uh, in which we shared findings from our focus groups in about the barriers to um, the barriers to community acceptance and he developed a set of um, messages uh, from religious texts uh, that he thought drew on those um, and in fact he was he was a really uh, he and uh, a Christian bishop that we worked with were, were quite eager participants in in the partnership because they had already been working to uh, shift attitudes around around community acceptance. And so he drew on some, on some of his, his own ideas there. And so there were three elements to the message. He emphasized the idea of, of forgiveness from a variety of Islamic texts. He announced that he himself would forgive fighters. Uh, and he called on his followers both to forgive them and to accept them back into the community. We played either that message or, or uh, to a randomly assigned control group, we played a placebo message about an unrelated topic, which was uh, about sanitation and health. Uh, in naturalistic small group settings um, as people listen uh, to the radio normally. Afterward, we asked a set of outcome questions related to whether you would accept people back into your community and also what you, what you continue to think about uh, these former uh, associates of Boko Haram. So what did we find? Um, let me orient you to this plot briefly. Um, on the x-axis are these, are these two conditions that we randomly assign people into, so this placebo in which they received an uh, audio message about, uh, about health and sanitation, uh, and on the right, this uh, message from this uh, trusted religious leader. On the y-axis is the uh, amount of uh, support for the behavioral intention for, uh, for example, allowing former associates to reintegrate, to allow them in community meetings, uh, ranging from about 40% uh, to around 80%. And so what we can see across this range of different kinds of behavioral intentions uh, from those that are, that are already uh, uh, supported around, around half uh, move up between 9 and 13 percentage points. Um, so across all of these different behaviors that are, that are more and less, kind of in, in more and less uh, intensive ways of, of coming back into the community, this message from a community leader seemed to have really shifted people's willingness to accept people back into, into their community. Similarly, we looked at whether this message shifted social norms, um, so shifted these perceptions of what other people think uh, other people are doing and think that you should do. And so we asked people whether they thought that their neighbors would allow people to return to their community, whether their community leaders and local religious leaders uh, thought they should do. And so sort of obviously we find that um, local religious leaders, people's perceptions of what local religious leaders sh uh, 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 were shifted. But more surprisingly, we also find that it shifts people's perceptions of what their neighbors are, are, are doing and think that they should do um, by, by kind of uh, similar rates. 
So in terms of the, the policy implications here, I think this provides, this is initial evidence that provides um, uh, motivation for using the tool of uh, elevating the voices of, of trusted local leaders uh, to shift uh, both attitudes but also behavioral uh, intentions uh, towards these important uh, pro-social behaviors. I think additional research is needed to understand what kinds of leaders and in what circumstances this, this kind of tool is going to be effective. Um, and a major caveat is that it, the messages did not shift people's underlying feelings towards former associates of Boko Haram. So levels of anger and levels of fear towards these former associates um, were not shifted at all. So this is a case of shifting social norms, um, shifting behavioral intentions without, without changing those, kind of, uh, those underlying feelings toward this group, um, which is a, a common feature of some, um, some of these kind of behavioral science findings. Um, so I'll give you a brief teaser for two other uh, parts of this experiment um, that, that, we're, that we're still uh, writing up. One is that we wanted to know whether we could change beliefs about the malleability of attitudes, because one of the major problems here is that people want to, people aren't sure whether these former associates have uh, quote unquote de could quote unquote de-radicalize. And so there's a set of social psychological interventions to uh, kind of shift your belief in, the, uh, in other people being able to change their minds. Um, and we find that that's quite effective at um, convincing people that, the, that these former associates might be able to change their mind uh, when they come back into the community. And then second, um, using a uh, literature from conflict resolution, which finds that uh, apologies from uh, individuals or groups um, about the uh, actions during conflict of, of another group can, can also shift um, attitudes and, and behaviors. Um, and we also find some, some evidence of that uh, in this context from, from a related experiment. So I want to leave on a, a kind of happy note, uh, which is that um, in, in 2018, or a positive note at least, um, in, in 2018 we found these really quite negative attitudes towards former associates of Boko Haram, and these have really improved in the last couple of years. Um, so a survey by the Managing Exits from Conflict Project, which is led by Siobhan O'Neill, who's presenting in uh, one of the other rooms, um, shows that those attitudes have gone up by about 20 percentage points. Uh, since our first surveys in 2017 and 2018. So now about 70% of people say that they would be willing to accept uh, these former members. And so maybe, maybe a speculative conclusion of this is that um, the, the widespread use of messaging uh, in, in the wild by, by religious leaders uh, may have been one component in, in shifting those, uh, these important behavioral intentions. So um, thank you very much.